we've been doing a, a family of eight uh, reunion each year, and um, amongst us, and there's many of you out there as there are on this side of the table, who are trying to keep these beasts alive, a lot of times the old stuff doesn't work the way it ought to or it isn't available. And so there have been a lot of, um, I guess, hybrid attempts to keep things running with modern components and old components and this, that, and the other thing. So um, each year I've been trying to bring people together to talk about what they've been doing, um, why they've been doing it, maybe, uh, <laughs> and really just have an open discussion with, with the audience because, like I say, you guys are the same people as, as us, which is probably too bad for you, but uh, there are a bunch of people doing a lot of things. So we really will go through our, our little panel here, but then very much like to hear what people are doing either with the stuff that you're hearing about or with your own stuff and, and where we'll be a year from now. So um, let me just introduce everybody and then we'll, we'll kind of go through this. Um, I think, well, no, I don't know. Uh, which of you guys came further? I think Malcolm did, right? Malcolm. Also yeah. Did. So, in, in order of travel distance, uh, <laughs> okay. Malcolm McLeod from Melbourne is here. Uh, Eric Hoppe from Germany. Kyle, oh no, Vince, I guess, from yeah. Beaverton, Oregon. Oregon. Yeah. Kyle from Huntington, do we say now? Huntsville. Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, Mark from down the road in Decatur, and I'm over there by the lake. So, um, these two guys in particular have been working together on the blinking boards project that you've seen out on the table, and, and that was the thing that made Jason Compton so happy that this is a panel of panels. <laughs> so, uh, that's, uh, but this is a project that Jörg started, what, five years ago? Yeah, so around 2011. Yeah, um, and built uh, several different blinking boards. If you haven't been by the table yet, you really need to see the PDP-15, just because it's such mm -hmm. a really strange and wonderful thing. Yes, yeah, so because it's the smallest I have, it fits in the suitcase. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then um, Jörg did an 1170 implementation that Mark also... So, yeah, I, I was uh, looking on uh, Jörg's uh, website and I saw this uh, 1170 implementation that he did and it just, uh, it absolutely uh, inspired me to, you know, Gosh, I, that would be really fantastic. So um, I contacted Jörg and um, uh, was able to get two of the key boards that you need, along with a beagle bone white, which was uh, kind of the thing that was going on. And I think this was about 2012 or 2013. The raspberry came later, yes. Yeah. And so anyway, um, you know, I, I started watching for PDP 1170 panels on eBay and... Uh, I ended up, uh, I missed one that went for about 800 bucks, but then a few, uh, um, well, maybe a year later, I got one at about 400 bucks, and it's kind of an unusual one because it's one that DEC uh, did as part of their commercial system, so it's labeled a DEC System 570, and it's in a blue and white uh, pattern instead of this beautiful uh, purple and maroon that I really like a lot better, but, uh, and... Uh, so that panel has three 40-pin IDE connectors, and you can get the schematics and see how the um, how the wiring needs to go. And the, the, yeah, there's a, a, a picture of uh, the panel that I got off of eBay. And so I started communicating uh, to with George to to get this built and um, I ended up doing mine a little bit differently than his. The logic of this translation from the I.O. to the cables that go to the panel itself, uh, Jörg did with uh, the, a very elaborate cable. Um, I'm an old wire wrapping guy and so I feel more comfortable wire wrapping and so mine is, uh, the logic is on the board itself just from the cables to the I.O. pins. You might have a picture, yeah, picture of that. Picture, many picture, but not the right one. Yeah. So uh, anyway, it was, uh, and then part of my interest was I'm an old uh, RSX 11M uh, programmer, and if you had a PDP 1170 or any of the blinking light panels, the light pattern on RSX is very unique, and so that that was the thrill I was looking for, is to see the old blinking light pattern. And uh, 
So anyway, it was a thrill the first time when I when I got it all hooked up and it and it worked. Uh, along the way, you learn a lot of things like those cables are numbered in a different order than an integrated circuit chip. And so uh, I wired it once, and then I had to rip all that wire out and wire it again the right way. But uh, so it's it's a lot of fun. But the cool thing is today you can do this yourself with virtual panels. So maybe I'll let George talk a little bit about okay. that. Before the handover, we yeah. had said uh, eye candy first in this show, <laughs> so no people won't leave. Um, So what you see here is a Java Java application which displays the panel. It's made of uh, tons of individual photos of switches and lights. You see each LED is, is different. It's just because I want it perfect. And this is connected over a network to a modified SimH. So SimH controls the panel and the panel controls SimH. We have here the SimH window. This is the RSX prompt. And if I hold on the panel, then you see SimH stops as if I hit uh, the Control E button. And if I continue here, it does. Ah, so okay. I can't continue because the switch is uh, hold is set. Okay, and it's running again. So the panel acts as a secondary keyboard and um, SimH displays the light patterns. This is, yeah, this is a, the basic of all. Yeah. This was mm -hmm. the question. And you have uh, many different Java panels available now. Yeah, shall we just have a look on each of the virtual panels? Well, at least do the 15. The 15, which yeah. is, all, okay. 15, uh, two 15s, one with Focal and one with XV and DOS. Is so here it is. It's green and white and blue. And do you want to talk about you know some of the cool functions on that? The, mm -hmm. I think especially for people that are used to the eight, mm -hmm. the fact that you can actually do a deposit here or deposit next, yes. examine here, examine next is really nice, mm -hmm. okay. plus the uh, frequency on it. So for first, you see it's an 80-bit machine, uh, 80, 80 data bits and 80 data switches. Addresses are 15 bits. Um, it's a deck panel like all. It tells here the stop. You can stop and to continue. And if I have stopped, I can here have this examine this and this examine next. What's very special is uh, we have here a general purpose register display. We have 24 registers to display on this machine. Uh, about a half is some internal maintenance stuff, which is, in fact, some. Uh, you must read the schematics to understand what they have there. But, uh, for instance, you can display the program counter there, or you can or you can display the accumulator there. It is not the accumulator. Here, this is the accumulator. The lower lower knob uh, selects the register they display here. So if I want to make memory examine and deposit, I must display OA. This is the operand address, which is uh, the register which is used to make the memory cycles. Okay, I set an address. This is address uh, 200, octal 200. Uh, didn't work in. Yeah. Okay, presentation effect. Okay, now it's working. And with the examine next, I have an auto increment. And I have two sorts of switches, uh, address switches and data switches, so there's no load address. So much more comfort than on the LM. Okay, and do you want to add anything else about your development process or mm -hmm. what you've done to make the boards work? 
the bots, um, do you mind do you mean the I.O. bot or? The, the Lincoln board process, mm -hmm. developing the CAPE and the, the drivers you had to write for, for SimH. Briefly. Okay, uh, all this is based on the BeagleBound byte, which is four years old now. Next step is I'm in progress on going on to the BeagleBound Black. And of course, there's always a Raspberry in mind. Every people ask me if I will support the Raspberry Pi. Should I? Should I not? This would be another discussion. It's of course much more powerful. I had a huge community, the Raspberry Pi. On the other hand, for the BeagleBone, it's all there. And this is extremely time consuming, this business. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, I have no clear, clear uh, I have no cleared up my mind on this. Maybe it'd be worth uh, also talking about the crossover with Oscar and the PyDPA. Ah, team. yes, 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 yes. Uh, you've seen from Oscar these small replicas, the PDP-8 and the new PDP-11, which we, will be come out next year, I have the mm -hmm. feeling, when you manage the, the plastic fabrication process. And the software inside the PDP-11 is also this blink-bound concept. So for me, this PDP-11 is just another panel. The PDP-8, he had made an own uh, SimH, but for the PDP-11, we worked together, and I was, I'm very proud I am part of that, his project. In fact, I, I made uh, the P, uh, um, a driver for his PDP-8 to show him, I can do it, please let me <laughs> to your project. <laughs> So it's, it's really an interesting, uh, you know, crossroads of several different things. So you think about real physical panels being reanimated with SimH. You have virtual panels based on Java being reanimated with SimH. And the internals are basically the same. The interface is what would slightly different. And now you have the replica series, the PyDP8, the PyDP1170, which, again, are based on the, the same basic SimH and, and interface uh, concepts. And on top of that, we're doing reproduction panels. Mm -hmm. So yeah. PyDP and um, 8 and 11 are both these one third, two third replicas. Two third replicas. Uh, if you look out on our panel, panel, panel table, <laughs> the um, bunch of reproduction panels being done by Rod Smallwood in England. Yeah. Uh, and take a look at those. If you've got one of these machines, at least one of the eight family machines, and you need panels, order from him the contact information is out there. But those are full-size panels that are meant, not meant to, but will drop into the original machines. And then Oscar and I think Rod as well are working together on reproducing the bezels to go around them. So you could, in a sense, build a full Lincoln bone replica, except maybe for the switches, uh, with new components. Mm -hmm. And Rod, in his sort of crazy mode, is talking about doing full reproductions of the machines, which I don't think so, but yeah. maybe. <laughs> Uh, but certainly the panels are getting better and better with each run. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you take a look at them, they're, they're really very, very nice and very reasonable. So if you need well, any... He's asking me all day how much they, he's asking for those. And I, I've always had to say, I don't know. Um, you could say that or you could say $150. Okay. Um, but I don't know for sure. That's what he has been asking. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's inclusive of postage or not. Uh, but he's literally stocking these things, so mm -hmm. if, if you have 10 machines that you need, uh, he can help you out. Do you want to say any more? Can we move on to this? Yeah. Okay, so Malcolm has been doing, uh, over the last year, more uh, interfacing through the teletype and some of that stuff. So you want to talk about your... Yeah, I've, I've, been, um, <clears throat> I've been interested in, in getting to know the current loop interface a bit better about understanding... Um, I guess the threshold currents for that represent a mark in a space and what's involved in drug, uh, driving the current loop at either end and, uh, and also interfacing through to ASR 33 teletypes which of course use the 20 milliamp current loop um, and they have three loops, there's the transmit loop, the receive loop for the keyboard and the printer and a third loop um, which is what's used to activate uh, the tape reader to read a, a row of tape um, into the into the machine, and um, and one extension of 
playing around, messing around with that stuff and just interfacing different peripherals to different computers, um, I put together a design for a USB, uh, USB to current loop board, if you like. So a little board about four inches by four inches. Uh, it's got a PIC microcontroller on it and it takes, it can draw power off the USB interface or from, a, say, a 12 volt wall, wall board. And from that, it's got some voltage conversion stuff on it. It'll generate an adjustable voltage between 15 and 25 volts and it'll generate all the loop currents. So you can basically have this board sitting, hanging off the back of a laptop via the USB cable and then run it straight off to a, a teletype and um, you can transfer, you can punch tapes, read tapes, print to the printer, um, you know, or, or use use the ASI33 as a terminal through the USA, through the um, through USB virtual COM port. So that's what I've been messing around with. Um, I've got a web page for it, um, which I can tell you about later. Uh, there's a whole bunch of information there about how current loops work and what this board's doing. Um, the firmware's still got a, a bit of work to be done on to clean it up, but it's actually usable as it is. And uh, it's probably been the main thing I've managed to actually bring to fruition over the last year or two. Mm -hmm. But uh, I've learned, certainly learned a lot about current loops in that process and understanding um, you know, how do you um, deal with noise and you know, all those sorts of things. And are you doing the 5 to 8 level conversion on that or not? Uh, it does do it as well. Yeah. Um, obviously you don't, you don't need, um, we're talking here about you know, the board up, the 5 bit codes versus 8 bit for ASCII or 7 bit for ASCII. Um, uh, the, the, I've built some extra functions into the firmware so that you can have um, 8 bit code or 7 bit ASCII coming out of the PC going through this board and coming out on the current loop side converted to board op um, or USTTY is one of the code sets that's often used and so you can you can also use this board to, to drive um, older model teletypes like the um, model 28 um, or I've, I've been using on some Siemens 5 bit teleprinters as well so it'll do all that sort of stuff as well but it's really, it's primary purpose is, is just on ASCII machines, 8-bit ASCII machines. And um, <clears throat> yeah, there's lots of interesting things in this project uh, for, me, for me, and a lot of it was just retracing or relearning the things that people who worked with this stuff 20, 30 years ago all had to learn the hard way around. Um, uh, for example, with an ASR33, most of the keyboards work on uh, seven data bits, plus they have the uh, eighth data bit uh, set so it has uh, mark parity and if you try to feed that into a uh, COM port into an application like SIMH it'll struggle with having that eighth data bit set so you've got to work out a way to actually mask that off but if you just mask it off and make it a seven bit data set then now you've got a seven bit tape reader and tape punch instead of an eight bit tape reader and tape punch so there's all these decisions you've got to make about is it working in seven bit plus marks mark parity or is it working 8-bit and no parity and you know it all depends on the context of what you're trying to drive it with and you can come up with all sorts of elaborate schemes to work out how you automatically switch it from 7 plus mark parity to 8-bit no parity depending on whether you're using the tape or the, uh, the tape or the printer and so on but there's no perfect answer is what I've learned as of other people have learned in the past and um, and learning about some of the physical limitations I've got an ASR 33 that's been reconditioned uh, by Wayne Durkee, who was a, a teletype uh, serviceman. He certainly knows his stuff when it comes to ASR 33s, and it runs about as well as I think any ASR 33 can run, but yet, even with that, if you try to read a long tape in, uh, like uh, 12K basic, um, you'll almost always get one or two frames that don't read correctly, and, and it's nearly impossible to get a perfect, consistent read. If you put that, put a 12K tape through the reader five times, you'll get five different checksums. And, um, and I was, tearing my, I was tearing my hair out trying to work out whether it was a problem with the tape reader, whether it was a problem with my conversion software, whether my firmware was dropping something. And um, at the end of it, after sort of going out to the forums and talking to people who worked with teletypes all those years ago, they said, you know what, that was common on new teletypes and new computers with new tapes 30 years ago. So don't expect to get lower error rates than what we were originally able to get. So it's quite interesting when you realise that and um, you sort of get past that limitation and you realise that even with you know, one bad byte read out of 12K basic usually runs fine. So <laughs> obviously it depends where the error is, right? But uh, yeah, so it's an, I've learned that paper tape's obviously an imperfect media for storing programs on and, and there's only so much you can do to get the errors out of it. Uh, and, and the other piece that we used it for 
was debugging the machine being able to generate a, a text, a test from the, the board so that it's, again, it's using a modern piece when mm -hmm. the whole chain is unknown, at least you've got one thing to stand on. Mm -hmm. So you got one solid place to work from. You work forward into the computer and back out through the teletype. And, yep. and, you know, yep. Which I think is kind of a good segue to Vince. Uh -oh. Yeah, <laughs> sorry to wake you up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Vince, Vince Lingstad has been for what, 10 years of the Too Much Stuff? Yeah, so, I think it's about yeah. that. Um, has been compiling an incredible archive of uh, deck data as opposed to a deck data system, right? Um, <laughs> and lots of things like bulb conversions and, and stuff, but the real gem of it is, is the literally thousands of schematics that he's reverse engineered, put up on the site to, of existing deck boards and then some more modern things. So um, in many cases, there's a board that uses obsolete chips and Vince will have the old version, or the old you know, version A, version B, version C, and then version X shows that same board, same function, but with contemporary bits and pieces. So uh, again, in Mal's case with a, an RKO5, the card that goes into the data slot, into the card cage on the RKO5, Vince has re-engineered that. He's done baud rate generators, done all kinds of things. In fact, I think at this point, really, there are far more cards that you've done than that haven't been done. The um, the single height and double height flip chips are necessary to build. Well, almost all of the single and double height flip chips they're necessary uh, for any model of PDP8. PDP8 is kind of my interest. Uh, so PDP11 guys are kind of yeah. Oh well, you get to do your own thing. Um, but anyway, <laughs> uh, for almost any model of uh, of the PDP8. Uh, the single and double height flip chips are done. Unfortunately, lots of people are interested in the um, omnibus boards, which are, are uh, quite height and uh, extended length. Uh, and the sheer amount of area there is daunting. It takes me a long, long time to draw uh, all of that mm -hmm. and get it all right. And uh, so relatively few of the omnibus boards are done, but the the single and double height flip chips are, are mostly done. The, the exceptions, of course, are things like the core plane uh, diode boards and things like that, where you would ha really have to take apart the core plane mm -hmm. to, re you know, to be able to see where the traces go and stuff like that. Uh, you know, that's... I'll send you pictures. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> some, that would be great. Um, things like that. And, uh, and uh, some of the G series... Uh, uh, Interface boards are uh, well, you know, they're kind of one-off things, and they were only used in whatever this is, and uh, they're typically, you know, uh, level translators or something of that sort, uh, and they also tend to lie outside my relatively limited uh, electronics engineering background. Uh, so, you know, the board does a bunch of analog stuff, and I'm like, it's magic. It's magic, yeah. To, uh, to me, it's magic. And so, the, you know, if it's just a matter of drawing it and making it look like the deck board, then sure, I can probably do that. But if it, you know, if it comes to creating an X version, I, I didn't understand it in the first place, and so I can't do that. And uh, so, yeah. And then I don't know whether you want to introduce some of my other work. You want me to just ramble? Yeah, ramble. Okay. Uh, I also do some things that, um, like I have uh, on my website, I have replicas, uh, 3D models for these uh, switch handles. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he's printed one. Uh, and uh, uh, also several of the uh, PDP-8 uh, switch handles, different, mo different models. Uh, various other things. I have started work on a uh, CalComp pen holder for Jack here. Mm -hmm. Recently acquired a CalComp drum plotter. If anybody has a real pen holder, let us know, please. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just uh, RAM stuff like that. I, as far as um, well, you know, there are some boards that that Jack mentions that I have actually done and sold uh, to people generally at cost. 
Uh, the, I do relatively little of that. I was uh, attended part of Jim Brain's talk earlier about how to productize stuff, and he was talking about doing a whole bunch of stuff that I usually don't do. And, <laughs> and uh, so uh, a lot of what I do is I have a wild hair idea, and then I will create CAD drawings or something, and then just never bother to build them. And, uh, you know, it's a hobby for me, and so I do the parts that I enjoy and kind of skip over the parts that sound like work. So, <laughs> it's just the way most hobbies work. <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, a variety of stuff, uh, particularly with a focus on the PPA. That's good. good. Okay, and then uh, Kyle, who's in the corner because he's smaller, but not really least, <laughs> just <right>. last, uh, <laughs> is uh, you know kind of the next generation. Because if you look at <laughs> us, <laughs> we're we're not the next generation, uh, and it's it's real important that that uh, this stuff continues. Uh, I don't know. Why don't you just talk about what you're doing? Well, so recently I've got a pick to write some software, so some of you guys may remember the HP 35 calculator. Um, I love HP calculators, I'm an engineer, RPN is great, but I realized that on the PDP-8 there isn't really just a generic calculator application, so what better calculator to emulate than an HP 35? Um, so recently I've actually started about three years ago, I wrote HP 35 simulator that uses the original uh, you know, ROM from the HP 35 and uh, got that working, took up 4K, so presumably you could run it on an original straight eight if you were so inclined. Did use some you know, instructions that were PDP 8E and onward only, but uh, over the past week I've added a bunch of functionality HP 45 is supported, as well as uh, you know, simple macro options. You can uh, assemble the whole thing to be 4K HP 35 only that will in fact run on a straight eight. So that's been exciting. Uh, I guess another fairly recent project has been a simulated VC8E uh, point plot display. Some of you that have messed with the PIDP 8 may be familiar with with my work, I teamed up with uh, Oscar to get it in on uh, on his project. So if you see Space War running on the PIDP8, that was, that was my little bit of code. He he kind of took it and ran with it. What I'd like to now do is get some of that back and shove it into SimH once and for all, so that it's native and doesn't require the hack job that I originally put together just to see if I could do it. So. I guess, just talking about it, I, I guess I could hook up the laptop and show that. If... Yeah, we can do that. Um, also, I, just looking around the room, I think that maybe, except for JD, the, if you guys have eights, you know about serial disk. Oh yeah. Um, so why don't you just talk, because that's been a really enabling piece mm. of stuff. Yeah, yeah, who here has used serial disk or knows what it is at least? <laughs> okay. Good, good handful. Uh, last year when we did our PDP, DP, uh, yeah, something like that. Anyways, uh, I talked about serial disk and I guess showed a demo maybe or something. Yeah. Anyways, uh, serial disk is a, hang on, it's a disk emulator that uses RKO5 disk images. It is not an RKO5 emulator. Just want to make that clarification. Uh, it talks over a uh, standard serial port on your PDP-8, so if you have a second serial card, you can configure it for use with uh, serial disk. Faster the better. I know there are some people in this audience even that somehow managed to make it work with 19.2 kilobaud. Let me tell you, that's painfully slow. Um, I've got mine set to 230.4K, and it's just a wee bit slower than an RKO5. So, serial disk doesn't really have any seek time. RKO5 does, so I think that's where I'm 
If I were to go one little step further, I'd beat an RKO5. But anyone who has a Sphere Sewer card and a C compiler on any Unix POSIX-like system can play with serial disk. I like the Raspberry Pi personally because it's small. I can throw it in the, the case of the PDP-8M that I like to carry around, have that hooked up and running. Uh, I've got a few features that I'd like to add to the main repository. It's all on GitHub, by the way. Um, for instance, supporting up to four RKO5 images with the non-system handler. Um, or there are some other features that you could think of. Verbose mode? The verbose mode, yeah. So for debugging purposes, there's uh, there'd be some nice, you know, things I could add that's you don't get otherwise without recompiling it. Um, so just kind of bringing that out. Oh, I guess the other thing that hasn't really changed since last year, but it's been easier to do, is the SOCAD stuff. Yeah. So you don't have to change images. You know, just... So um, I guess with uh, you're talking about with SimH. Yeah. yeah. So SimH, very powerful tool, really wonderful to use. It provides the auxiliary uh, teletype interface, uh, which means presumably I could get serial disk running on it. So on a whim, I'm like, okay. Uh, found this little application called SoCat, which takes uh, generic, you know, TTY, converts it to a telemetable port. And I can actually use that, to redirect it to a file, and then I use uh, serial disk to talk to that file. Anyways, the whole point is when I first did that, I didn't really see a point in it other than maybe automated test scripts and whatnot. I could make a change to serial disk and then have a little test script that runs. Well, come to find out, no, it's actually pretty useful because you can build up an entire disk image with some age then use that disk image on your real hardware. So you don't have to rely on the real hardware working when you first get your disk image. And I think that's been somewhat useful already. Um, well, it, it's been very useful in that the original serial disk required a specific driver that was unique to serial disk. Whereas with SOCAT, you can run the identical images you'll run on your hardware. Right. So you don't need to have something that differs, you know, there's not a, you're removing one unknown. Right. So you really can have a proven RKO5 image yep. that you take from one environment to the other. Kind of like playing with the real panel mm -hmm. in the Java. It's, yes. You know, it's, it's tremendous leverage. With serial disk, I do offer both system and non-system handlers. So say you have a, a working RKO5 or if you're lucky enough, a T56 based setup, you can add in the non-system handler and still be able to talk to, uh, to modern hardware. You could back up your existing stuff. Now, Dave Gaswan, for those who are familiar, have uh, probably used the dump rest utilities, dump and restore, and uh, that's actually what I base serial disk on. So uh, you could use the dump rest and restore from TU56, RKO5, RX, whatever. Uh, now you can also use serial disk and using OSA utilities like PIP back up to, uh, to other devices. So you're not, uh, you're not necessarily limited to just the, the dump rest programs. And also, um, I don't know, Vince or Kyle or both of you, what's the story with Alan Hightower's uh, USB or CPLD omnibus project? So I guess he's not here. Yeah, background is uh, there. There was a, a Philip Hashman made a FPGA CPL. I guess technically CPLD based um, uh, serial board, and it could go lightning speeds. Works great with serial disk, in fact. But it, looking at it, it was a board that big with about that much in the way of electronics on it. So it's really kind of a waste of board real estate. And those boards aren't cheap, I mean, to have the gold-plated edge connectors, right? So anyways, my buddy Alan looked at it and was like, oh, well, I can make you one of those, uh, you know, no problem. Decided to get rid of all of the bus drivers. That was another uh, point of contingency among uh, PDP-8 enthusiasts was what bus drivers can you use to talk to Omnibus or Unibus or, or whatever. 
uh, the 8881s or whatever, you know, are, are you required to use these or can you use other open collector? Well, I'm of the camp that believes you can use, you know, open collector so long as they're powerful enough. It turns out there is a CPLD from Atmel that is not only five volt, but it also can sync up to absurd like 60 milliamps or something per pin, which means you can throw that directly on the Omnibus or Unibus or wherever. And it's not a you know, super big CPLD in terms of macro cells, but it should be plenty for a serial port. So now we basically condense that big board into a little shorter board with one CPLD wired out to the bus and uh, it's not a CPLD, it's a CPLD. <laughs> it's, a, it's a CPLD. It's, uh, it is much more condensed in terms of the board size, which makes it more difficult to remove from the bus, but hopefully you're not having to do that very often. I guess you could make a little riser. Or you use a thing for a towel wrapped around your knuckles. Yes, yeah. towel wrapped around your knuckles, I like it. Um, but it's got a USB uh, type A, or uh, type B, whatever, the printer, standard printer cable, <coughs> USB, yeah. plug that in, uh, and we're still working on the software for it. Uh, we're kind of forced to use WinCouple. Any of those out there who have done any couple whatsoever probably knows it's a real pain in the rear. Verilog or VHM would be nicer, but that requires a special license from Atmel to use their pro design. And I think it's a yearly license. So it's a yearly license. Toast. Well, it would actually for, be good because it would mean that you guys would get it done within a year. Well, <laughs> no. What it would mean is that every time we, want to, we wanted to get around to going back to it, we would fail to do so because to do so would require us, since it had been six months since we last looked at it, to pay another thousand bucks. <laughs> so what we really need is for someone to write a Verilog or VHDL to couple, and then we'll just shove that into the, the Win Couple program and, and call it done. But that's really the, the last thing really to, to get this board running is the software. Hardware is there. Surely it should work. Uh, I have used the hardware uh, to implement a real-time clock. Okay. okay. And, and that seems to work. Now, I didn't finish the testing. It was one of the many projects that uh, I got distracted from. But, but a real-time uh, clock, if it works for the first few milliseconds, it should continue to work forever. Right? Uh, what I'm pretty sure you can do is you can output to the board, and that works fine. Okay. What I, is unclear is whether the board's drivers can actually pull down the bus. And I believe that they can, Except that I know because I took another board, did a very similar thing, and tried to create an RXAE, I know that it is not possible to pull um, the reset line uh, with, with, with a single pin. You can't pull the reset line. There's not but you can a little bit. Uh, you probably could, but that would, of course, require blue wire. And can we measure? About that time, I stopped working on that project. Can we so. measure the current that it takes to pull down the reset line just to have a ballpark? I, yeah, I think we can figure that out. But um, uh, well, that might be beyond the scope of our panel discussion here as to how but, much current it takes to sync the the reset line. But the spec but, for the reset line is quite a bit higher. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, it, I think it's closer to 100 mile or something like that, but it might even be more than that. Wow. And, um, but it, it, and it pulls the funny direction, too, I think, that you have to pull it up instead of pulling it down or some crazy thing. But anyway, uh, that did not work. Well, my, the, the, that is as far as I got on my RXAD testing because there's nothing, there's no, there's no logic in that path. There's just the driver, right? He comes up and he tries to pull that line when you push the clear button on the front panel. And it wasn't getting that. You push the clear button and the you do not hear the floppy go clank, clank, clank. <laughs> and, and I looked at that and said, oh, and that's it. Back to the drawing board. Back to the drawing board. Box. Yeah, well, probably not. But yeah, if I was licensing uh, uh, VHDL, then it would definitely be expensive. <laughs> Ignoring that issue, could that board support two serial ports? Is there enough? Uh, 
our not microcells and pins. Uh, the experimenting, the experimentation that I have done is I have taken them for. Uh, I've, one of the things I do is I create monstrous Perl scripts. So I've created Perl scripts that will suck up the omnibus board designs, find the logic, and emit the equations as a CUPL file. And then you can assemble them and put them in the CPLD. Now I've done that for several, like the RX80 and several boards uh, that I happen to have already finished drawing, because they're on the bus cards, drawing the schematic is a monstrous task, and drawing the board is an even more monstrous task, but, but I've got a few of them done, and I, I've managed to translate them into CUPL, and they generally compile and barely fit. So, now the serial are probably a little simpler than most, yeah. and so you might get away with two of them. <coughs> but, uh, there might be some shared logic, too. Right. Yeah. But it is interesting that the that the Atmel CPLDs, uh, their capability is very close to that of an omnibus car. <laughs> so, so maybe what we need is a board with like six of these. Right, so you go back to the full size board, yeah. but fill it with <laughs> got one of each of every yeah. cool omnibus car you always wish you had. Um, I think we've kind of gone around this group, I mean, we can sort of babble on for a really long time, but... Uh, is, is now the time we talk to the audience? Now's the time when we say, Ethan or Warren or anybody else who's working on stuff, do you have things to add or you want to talk about what your projects are? Warren could talk about his flip chip tester, which has been a mythical beast for a very long time. Uh, if you're a good kid, you might have to get a Christmas present. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll move on to Ethan. Uh, <laughs> no, um, because these boards, and, and again, I, I think I'm talking to an audience knows what we're talking about, but prior to the 8E, the more interesting 8s were built out of flip chips, or if you got really interesting, built out of system cards. Um, but small cards that have very small bits of discrete logic on them. And... Um, Card count in an 8i is a couple hundred, something like that. Uh, on PDP 12s, lots, uh, 15s, lots. Some of the other stuff that's coming up, the straight eights, lots. lots. Uh, straight eight starts to get into really difficult territory, but in between, there are a bunch of uh, uh, M series cards that are really pretty much straight digital logic. Then there are a bunch of very funny cards. There are the G's and yeah, the A's and the R's and S's that have become timing dependent that people just sort of say it would be nice but don't think about. But in terms of the M's, there have been at least two or three chip testers, flip chip testers, card testers that will save a whole lot of time. Again, being able to put together a system with known good cards is, is really very helpful. So Warren with the guys that, well, Warren really, so but... what originally happened was in Rhode Island Computer Museum, the first, uh, I, I do contract work, and I was doing a contract in Connecticut, so I drive over to Rhode Island on Saturdays for an adventure. And uh, they had all these old eights, and nobody was working on them. I said, we've got to get some of these running. So the L was the first project, and I would guess... I don't know, you go through the uh, restoration log on their website, and there were probably at least 40 flip chips that we had that. Wow. So, uh, long nights in Connecticut, I started doing this. I wire wrapped up a flip chip tester, and of course, the magic sauce is the test vectors to actually go through the testing. And uh, I've got a pretty good set of four and I. Pretty good set. So the actual hardware is, is not very complicated. What I'm going to be building is a USB-based one using a um, Adreno as the interface, and basically the Adreno or uh, a standalone Adreno GUI. So you put a touch TFT on it and plug in an SD memory card and test a lot of cards. But I even went as far as I was playing with it earlier. I had a front panel, panel test thing that would turn blinky lights on 
front panel, and it makes it a lot easier to test the things, because how the heck do you turn that data brick light on? Um, and it's uh, for the TTL logic. I played with it a little bit on RMS logic for a straight eight. The version I'm doing now will not support that directly, although I think I'll be able to modify it very easily when it's good. But uh, yeah, the chips are cheap. You know? I think I got uh, $15 of ICs on it. The biggest problem is the edge connector. The edge connectors and the test vectors. Well, the test vector, the magic sauce, yeah. Right. Although, again, this is the kind of project that um, once there's a hardware base, it's a very nice community project. I actually, wrote, I actually wrote a little C program to generate the standard and NAND or type. You yeah. Know, so if you got you know, seven three input NAND gates, just give it the pins and it generates the file. Yeah, I have some the worst like card was the M220 card, if anybody's been in oh, that. Yeah. That thing is huge. That's a double wide, uh, two bits of ALU slice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, that particular one, I had to uh, uh, upgrade my program because it was like close to 2,000 test vectors. So. Yeah. Oh. And it is not 100% coverage. I've got some notes in there that there's some of the carry logic. The way the carry logic works, there's basically two bits with three inputs, so you have nine possibilities. And I'm not quite positive that I have 100% covered. But in general, it, you know, it's it's much easier to scope or single step it um, out of the machine. A lot of the logic, you'll have it, it can be kind of hard to make a test loop that will actually hit one bit. One of the things I like about your tester over some of the earlier work that Hank and I did uh, is that you can you can vary the load. One of the common failure modes of a board yeah. like the M220 is that the the H40 drivers yeah, aren't, a, aren't H40 problem. drivers yeah, anymore. Yeah. Basically, I put four sets of resistors that would emulate a you know a single high or low. Uh, output load, and also a 3 high and a 3 low. The 7440s are 48 mil low. So you put that on there and measure the voltages, and it's pretty quick to see that it's a soft driver. And a lot of times they will. They'll be a soft driver. They won't necessarily go completely out. If they're completely out, the straight logic test will find it. You're right. Yeah. And then I also set up stuff so that for the, uh, the memory column drivers, Roam column drivers that you can hook up fit minus 15 to it. The tester itself won't drive it, but you run the TTL in, make the pins wiggle, and then it's pretty easy to go back through them. And once again, if you have a driver card in memory, you know, what sequence do I address memory to see this one come on, this one come on, this one come on, this one come on? So it, it, it's very nice to be able to just. Plug it in, hook it up, and say, oh, okay, all these work. But it's pretty much for an I or an L or a 15 is all in logic, a 12. S. S is our logic. Yeah. There's a bunch of M in there, too. Mm -hmm. Straight 8 and S are. Yeah, there are R's and S cards. And in theory, you should be able to take two or three of these time together and and wiggle pins on an omnibus car. But I wouldn't yeah. want to create those test Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't, I don't I'll, I'll start looking at that as soon as uh, Vince gives me the schematics that I need. So. Long ago, I built a, um, a VIC-20 based uh, single height flip tip tester, and it got as far as the hardware. And I went to the test vector problem on a VIC-20, and I haven't turned it on since. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you have to realize, you know, I. Uh, I don't know, I was there a couple of years in Connecticut. You sit in the hotel room in the middle of winter. I wrote a lot of test vectors. Well, this is from a guy coming from North Dakota. South, South Dakota. Dakota, excuse me, the worst, well, much warmer. The two. That's yeah. a big, big difference. So, Connecticut winter is sort of like a summer night. <laughs> yeah, except for the, what was it? The big uh, snow we got? Uh, the one that buried my car. Okay. <laughs> and I mean, literally buried it. You couldn't see the top. 
Ethan, do you have anything special you want to talk about? Or? Uh, let's see. I don't know. Lately, I've been working on a lot of uh, PDP 11 restoration. And for me, uh, the goal is trying to come up with enough test platforms for just being able to repair this stuff that um, the, uh, the, the, and again, it ties in with emulation of modern stuff. I have a PDP 1120 that I've had for years and years. Uh, I literally fished it from the dumpster at work. <coughs> my, my supervisor had, I think he chopped out the power supplies and the fans and threw the rest in the dumpster. So I have the boxes, I have the cards. I just recently went and inventoried the cards, and to my delight, I found that I have a KE11. Because my goal all along has been to restore this to run 1972 Unix on a 1972 processor. <laughs> the one thing that I will not be able to just pull out of a box somewhere is an RF11. And the kernel assumes that you have an RF11 fixed head. So there's the DF32s, which are a little more common. This is a just a, a bigger version. There's the, a puck of eight heads at a time under the platters, but mechanically it's similar. Big, thick steel platter with a coating, uh, table saw motor, and a lot of logic. And the um, the, uh, the logic for an RF11 is, is pretty big. It's one of the ones that has the big blinking lights box at the top of the, the rack. Mm -hmm. And you can have up to eight spindles on a fully tricked out RF11. Like the DF32, you can address you know, any word. You can just start writing and it just cascade. Just, I want to move this many words and it'll just pick the right logic. So from that standpoint, um, the, the logical thing is, much like there are current modern solid state DF32 emulators, this just has to be a bigger one with all of the logic to make it an RF11. Um, and that's, that's, that's the big sticking point. Everything else I can do with, with vintage hardware, but the RF11 is the one thing that is not going to be easy to just pull one out and plug it in. And that's, uh, my goal is uh, for the 15th anniversary of Unix. I got a few years to make that happen. Okay. Alan, you made the mistake of walking into a place where we've been talking about what you were doing, but you weren't here to hear it. So do you want to add anything? Or Omnibus. Blink and Bones and the Omnibus board. Oh, so I have a million projects all in parallel, and so I make very little day to day progress in any one. But uh, two that are currently running um, that I could definitely use help on is a uh, PDPA serial card replacement. You know, Phil Hatchman did a really great card that had a uh, USB port to, to, do, uh, to use Kyle's disk emulator among other things. So this would be a hobby-friendly through-hole, five-volt version, so no surface mount components, so people could buy it with a kit and build it themselves. Um, that's kind of ready to test. I just I don't know that we have a working eight here to test. We can on. have one here tomorrow if you got one to test. Yeah, we have, I have one to okay. test. We can actually maybe get that running. Tomorrow. All right, then I'll bring mine in. And then, do, do you have CPLD programming for it? Yes, so it's, it's oh, using oh. a ATF 1500 or 50,000 series, 1500 series, so 1508, um, which actually has enough drive strength to actually drive the signals on the bus, at least we think. Yeah. I haven't actually tested it yet in a working machine. Yeah, we talked about that. Yeah. So this is not the reset problem. Uh, well, I don't think the serial card needs a reset. No, but the machine does. <laughs> uh, right. It doesn't have to pull the... It yeah. doesn't have to pull the floppy uh, reset line. So then the other the other project is maybe improving the Blink and Bone project um, to try to make it a little more um, assembly friendly, or, or even maybe just do a production run. It's all going to be surface now, and make it a little more flexible, where you actually have just a big array of FETs for the outputs, with uh, all the sources and drains exposed, charge pumps on the gates. So you could drive high side or low side switch or both if you want to. You drive a motor, you drive a needle or something. Mm -hmm. And even at, at lunch, we're talking about other improvements where we could add, uh, you know, just an array of op amps and some ADCs and DACs. You know, if you need to drive analog meters or dials and read them. So that, that that's still kind of the definition. Okay. Anybody else have? Things that they're working on, or wish they had working, or whatever. Because this is the end of our hour, so we can we can just kind of wrap it up. Would you, would you want to uh, talk about the SCSI to SD uh, kinds of things, or um, kind of out of scope? Yeah, I mean it, it's a little bit out of scope, but it's certainly something people. If if you're using in particular QBus, mm -hmm. um, the SCSI to SD card from Mike. What's uh, Matt, Michael McMaster yeah. in Australia. Uh, mm. 
New Zealand or Australia? Australia. 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 So another one of these guys um, mm -hmm. has done a, a really nice, up to rev five, right? Six. Six. Really nice card that one side is SCSI, feeds directly into an SD device. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason it's a little bit out of scope is it's for anything SCSI. Mm -hmm. So my logic analyzers are now running off SD cards instead of SCSI hard drives. Um, and I think you'll see other people using them around here too, but it's just been a, a fantastic piece to get a system up and running. And um, really like serial disk, it doesn't care what's there. So you can very easily put a serial, uh, an SD card with a disk image into your machine, come up on the SCSI bus, go to another DU device. Boot it straight and, away. Yeah. And, and you can do some um, some really neat stuff. It, <clears throat> it, it can emulate, or you, you can emulate a, a SCSI hard drive. It can also emulate a SCSI CD-ROM drive. And so what you can do is that in the memory space of the SD card, you can put, say, the images of, say, 10 CDs, like distribution CDs for operating systems. And then you can use another part of the memory space of the SD card as your hard drive. And so you can plug this one device into your, into your SCSI bus on, so a VAX machine, and that can actually have the install disks with the VMS media on it, and it can have the target disk that you're installing to also on the same disk. Yeah. So um, it solves the problem of how do you get um, you know, a, a, a SCSI um, CD-ROM reader that's compatible with whatever it is, 5, 12 byte blocks and all that sort of stuff that is a challenge these days in trying to use CDs on old equipment. So it solves multiple problems. It's really yeah. a device. In the uh, PDP-11 world, I'm using one on my 1183 that's in the, on the floor. And on one little 2 gig card, I've got every RSX SIG tape ever produced. And they're all as, um, you know, dot disks. They're not as tapes, so I can mount them with BCB. And I can, I can quickly get to any piece of software ever uh, released by Dicus. So that that's that's really powerful. The new version of it, I guess, version five, you said. So so the version version five will run just off pull its hard or pull its power straight from the SCSI bus, so you don't need to run external power to it. The version you have termination power on. It. That's right. As long as you have termination power, and and you can again configure multiple disks on one card. The version six will run synchronous, and he's upgrading the speed. And I just try, I got one of those and tried to get my little microvax or vax station 4090A to recognize it, and I, I don't have that working yet. It works on the PDP, but not yet on the back, so I'm still debugging that. You also went to four bit on SD cards, so, so access yeah. to SD card is way faster now. So I actually keep up with SCSI bus, whereas the older PSOC based uh, versions won't. Right. Mm -hmm. Under one bit, 25 megahertz. Yeah. So I can get transfer rates of, um, you know, that approach like some of the early disks that we saw at the time, you know, I.O. rates, maybe 60 I.O.s a second, that type of thing, but uh, to get to get it to really perform on the Vax, the new card has is, is got the right stuff. So he's still updating the firmware, firmware basically once a month uh, these days. Paul? Take questions? Sure. Sure. Uh, I, I missed something earlier, I think. Was it your reverse engineering because you don't have access to the deck schematics or the deck schematics are inadequate? Many of the PDF scans are quite cruddy uh, and difficult well, to read. About that. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but in general, I, my preferred working style would be to draw the schematic from the deck drawing. Um, and then draw the board from photographs. And what that does is it allows me to verify my work because if I'm drawing the board from the photograph and the trace cannot go there, then there is a mistake in the schematic. And whether that was my mistake or Dex's mistake, but anyway, I managed to find it as opposed to having to build a board and debug it. Right. Uh, the hope is to be able to document uh, all of the deck boards, uh, ideally in their original layout, although not all the work has original deck layout. Um, and uh, sort of 
Uh, I guess well, just document. The reason I'm asking is because a lot of the deck, the, the single light boards are documented in different. Some of them are handbooks that are almost used. I mean, they're, they're not large enough to see, but there are some large uh, sets of prints that do have those in there. Yes. And I don't know if you just don't have access to them, or I'm, I, I, I do in them. general I have access to them. Uh, there are there are certainly missing ones that I that I haven't found yet, uh, and like I say, I prefer to draw the schematic from those, just because it's faster for me uh, to be able to reproduce it from an already existing schematic than to try to infer it from the layout. Okay, because I was going to say, if there's another um, schematic wise, let me know, and I'll I'll try to dig it. I've got okay. file cabinets full of stuff. I have go up. Yeah, I, well, I've. I've, I've certainly tried to plagiarize from any place I can find them. I, you know, BitSavers and various other places have uh, flip chip schematics in PDF form, and I generally try to vacuum those all up and uh, and put them next to uh, the Eagle CAD drawings that I'm doing. One of the other things he's doing also is different board versions. Yeah. There isn't really any good documentation as far as what versions. Some of the schematics aren't in existence. Being able to compare them all that is it's useful. Yeah. yeah. The, the other question I had regarding uh, testing, I used to deal with a number of uh, depot services that had, I think some of them had data automation, or I, I can't remember the name of the company. It might have been, uh, I, I, I don't quote me on that, but they had actual boards, like some of the old tube testers, you can take an idea of what card, put it in there, and then it set it up to test a particular type of tube. Mm -hmm. They had board testers that were sure. that. Sure. I and have not seen any of them in years, mm -hmm. but they did exist for DEC and other manufacturers. Uh, yeah. Sure. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I fear that they've been lost because I've never seen them. In a previous life, I did a bunch of contract work with military, but it costs no object. Some of the test systems there is more wonderful, but uh, the current state of the art, the beta nails and logic testers, um, you know, take your number of pins and multiply by thousands. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'd love to find an old tester, but I don't think it's possible for everybody in the room to have one. So, so send your boards to. Warren and you <laughs> okay. testing service. It helps if you stuff it with hundred dollar bills for yeah. that. Right. Well, I figured you'd just keep all the working ones and yeah. send them back out. <laughs> <laughs> two for one. You know, send me two boards, get one back. But there yeah. there is a sort of ongoing brainstorming effort and and of course the problem is the problem is a hard problem. And hard problems are difficult to get closure on with volunteer labor. And so, you know, I worked on a flip chip tester for a while and said, oh, those problems look hard, and stopped. And Warren is going through, and he has gotten farther, uh, but I anticipate that at some point he will stop. Probably short, for instance, of uh, doing straight eight or, you know, RNS well, module I'm, testers I'm and things like that. I'm committed to, I'm going to do a public record to getting my new one done because my AI I recently acquired, I'm not going to test on my wire wrap one. Okay. That'll give me a little kick to get it done. <laughs> All right, we should probably wrap because people are trickling in. Yeah. You're not the first, but it's okay. <laughs> uh, Jim, are we we're about right anyhow? We're time? Okay. So any other questions and quick ones or um, you know where to find us. We know where to find you. So Come on by. Thanks a lot. We'll do it again next year. Thanks. Thank you. Okay.